How long do we go, Jerry? Uh, 30 minutes or less. Okay, doke. Hello, and thank you for... Oops, sorry, let me start that over. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Feed Ace Podcast. My name is Jerry Serino, and I'm your host, and I'm here with talent on loan from Rush. You know, when I was a kid, and I can honestly, I can remember as a kid and uh, going to uh, pro-life events and and even, you know, you know marching a couple times. I remember walking uh, down uh, Menor Avenue, which is, uh, you know, up here in uh, near Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, knowing full well about Operation Rescue, you know, I, I had I could remember seeing flyers at my, mom, you know, at home and at my grandma's house and the like Operation Rescue. And never in a million years would I think that I would be speaking with the founder of Operation Rescue all these years later. And I am distinct, have the distinct privilege of speaking to Randall Terry, who was the founder of um Operation Rescue, and also a long-standing pro-life advocate who has been instrumental in this movement and continues to be because the fight continues. So I want to welcome Randall Terry, uh, founder of Operation Rescue, to the show. Randall, thanks for being here. Jerry, it's a pleasure to be with you, sir, and I pray we have a great show, and it's uh, inspirational as well as educational. Yeah, well, that's what I always hope to do, right? I always like to, you know, my tagline is knowledge, faith, and hope. Uh, and I'm sorry, knowledge, faith, and truth. Um, and uh, that's that's what I want. That's what I want, right? That's what we're doing here, and that's what you've done for so many years uh, with all that you've done. And you, you make my head spin actually when I look at all the things that you do. You you've written many books. You're producing movies, and we'll talk about some of those. You've obviously you know, founded and, and done so much, uh, you know, with, with, uh, operation rescue. It, it's incredible. I, I don't know when you actually sleep or not, but, but I, I want to, I want to start with, you know, going back to the beginning, you know, I was watching the, you know, the video and, and I'll share, um, this, this video on operation rescue, um, uh, to all my, all my listeners and those that follow me and the like, uh, but tell me, you know, how how it began for you like what 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 and when did you take that step to say i'm going to dedicate my life to this cause <clears throat> well first of all i want to give you one of my life verses from the scriptures in hopes that it will encourage other people saint paul wrote god has chosen the weak things to overthrow the mighty the foolish things to confound the wise the things that are not, to set it not, the things that are, so that all glory would be his, so that no flesh could boast in his presence. And when I look back at some of the footage that you were referring to, and I look at what we were doing 35 years ago, and my beginnings in the pro-life movement literally four decades ago, I feel like I'm a third party in the room. <laughs> like I'm looking mm -hmm. at it going, really? We said that, we did that, right. that's crazy. And I, I say that to say, God can use anyone. He said through the prophet Isaiah, you worm Jacob, I will take you and make you into a threshing instrument that beats the mountains to chaff. God says, I'll take a worm, squishy, gooey, no backbone. I'll take a worm and I'll turn it into a threshing instrument beat the mountains to chaff. So everyone who's watching can do more and say more than they think they can because of the power of God, because of the ability of Almighty God to give us strength that's above our human strength, to give us wisdom beyond our human wisdom. So if you feel like you're weak, foolish, and that you're a zero, you are who God is looking for. <laughs> You'll fit the bill perfectly. Well, that gives me hope then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, me and you both. So in the fall of 1983, I was um, in the ministry. I had graduated from a, a evangelical, charismatic Bible college, Elam Bible Institute, great school, missionary school. And I thought I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm not called to social issues. And I was in this conflict, constant conflict. 
because as you and I know, Catholic theology encompasses all of life, politics, government, the judiciary, business, education, the arts, everything. Well, there was a man named Dr. Francis Schaeffer, who was an evangelical PhD, a great philosopher. And he wrote a couple of really intense books, wrote over 20 books, but he confronted the evangelical world with the, what I would call the sin of escapism, where we got to escape from the culture, like Amish people with nice clothes and cool cars. And one night uh, in the fall of 83, it would have been October of 83, I was in a prayer meeting and it was a Wednesday evening and a woman came in and there was maybe 20 of us in church, maybe 25. And, you know, the pastor said, we're going to have prayer requests now. And she was crying, said, I just saw a special on the PTL club with Jimmy Baker about abortion. And they showed dead babies on TV and this is horrible. And we've got to pray that God ends it. And so as I'm hearing her talk, I had that normal sick feeling in my stomach that I would get every time I thought about child killing. And I thought, yeah, this is really bad. Somebody should do something. So we broke up into our little groups, went into different Sunday school rooms. And maybe there was five of us in our room. And when it was my turn to pray, I was praying, God, please, in Jesus' name, you know, bring an end to this. So I'm praying, I'm standing there looking at this wall, which is kind of a blank wall. And I had a vision and that was not normal for me. I, I had, I saw a scroll coming down in front of me with words telling me what I was supposed to do to fight abortion. Mm -hmm. And I could picture thousands of people around abortion clinics. I saw myself on the Donahue show. Phil Donahue, back in the day, he was a competitor. Oh, no, I know him. Yeah. Yep. yep. So I'm seeing all this and I didn't say a word to anybody. I, I thought maybe I'm losing my mind. Maybe I'm crazy. I, I, I didn't know what to think. So I didn't say a word. I went home and I prayed, Lord, you know, if this is you, you, you got to show me. So I started searching the scriptures like any good Protestant. And I stumbled onto this theme of innocent blood, blood crying from the ground. And usually in the scriptures, when it talks about the shedding of innocent blood, not always, but usually it's talking about child sacrifice. It's talking about the abominable crime and sin of, of offering children and their blood to demonic entities. Yeah. And I thought, that's it. This is from God. God wants me to fight abortion. And I didn't tell anyone for about a month. I told my one of my close friends then, <laughs> years later, he told me, he said, I, when you told me, I thought you'd lost your mind. He said, I thought you were crazy. Cause I told him about the vision and what was gonna happen. So anyway, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I, I in the spring of 84, I started standing in front of the abortion mill in our town, Binghamton, New York, by myself. Didn't I'd never heard of Joe Scheider, never heard of pro-life activism. I I didn't know that there was literature. I just was standing there. And when a woman would come in who I thought was going for an abortion, I would talk to her and say, Can I help you? It was very demoralizing at the beginning, but that was the beginning. And then as time went on, uh one or two people would stand with me and then five or 10. And then we had pickets and signs. And then we started to get news coverage. And then I was introduced to other pro-life activists around the country. And then in the uh, spring of 86, I, I participated in my first civil disobedience where I was arrested for peaceful protests. We went into the abortion clinic, seven of us, and chained ourselves to the equipment and to the tables and said, we're not leaving. You're not going to kill babies today. Mm -hmm. So when I was in jail for that, I, I had a furthering of the picture of what I was supposed to do. And the Lord showed me that my job was to recruit clergy, that the key was to recruit clergy to go to the abortion mills, get arrested, blockade the abortion mills. We would sit a uh, hundred of us, 500 of us, a thousand of us in front of an abortion clinic, singing, praying, 
priests, pastors, Catholics, evangelicals, and we would say, we're not moving. As long as you intend to kill babies here, we are not moving. And they would arrest us. And it just, the movement grew and grew and grew and grew mm -hmm. and became the largest peaceful civil disobedience movement in American history. We had over 75,000 arrests. The civil rights movement from 1958 to 1968 under Dr. King and Ralph Abernathy, they had over 7,000 arrests. We had 10 times the number of arrests for peaceful protest. It was massive. It was huge. So there's the, that's how it all began. Wow. You know, it, it's, a, it's amazing. And, and it's amazing that not only were you called to, to get into this fight, you, you had no idea how long that fight would last, right? And even it took all these years just for Roe v. Wade to be overturned, but your fight isn't over yet. Right. It's yeah. still going, maybe even more, more challenging now, uh, especially, you know, in places like New York and California, uh, you know, here in Ohio, we have a we're going to have a ballot initiative uh, come forward in November, uh, trying to, the left, trying to put abortion on our uh, the Ohio Constitution. Uh, so so w I want to ask you, you, you talked about, um, you know, getting the clergy involved. What do you where do you think things stand today with the clergy clergy in general? Are they doing what they need to do as far as this this issue? No, no, we're way we're way worse than we were 35 years ago. Yeah. 35 years ago, we had in the evangelical world, we had Jerry Falwell, D. James Kennedy, Dr. Dobson, Pat Robertson. In the Catholic world, we had John Cardinal O'Connor some great giants and there were men of valor and there were men like Bishop Austin Vaughn, uh, auxiliary Bishop in New York who was arrested with us nine times and told Mario Como governor of New York at the time that if he didn't repent, he would end up in hell for his support of child killing publicly stated this. And Cardinal O'Connor said, I'm standing with my Bishop. Those days are behind us for the most part. And whether it's the evangelical world or the Catholic world, I'm, I'm sad to say that men of valor and clarity are sadly lacking. Courage and clarity is in, in short supply these days. You know, it, it, to, to be sad or to, to point a sad thing out, the Catholic Church right now, of whom I am a part, um, the church receives billions with a B, billions of dollars for various programs, including resettling mm -hmm. immigrants, which we want immigrants to be treated properly, obviously. But there has, it has resulted in a conflict of interest because mm -hmm. most of the money that is coming into various Catholic programs by the billions comes through legislative agendas from Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I I tragically <laughs> have to tell you, if you look at the voting statistics, roughly half of Catholics have voted for baby killing candidates from 2000 to present. Half of the Catholic community voted for Hillary. Half of the Catholic community voted for Obama. Half of them voted for Biden. Now, these are people with blood on their hands, the baby killers. I'm talking about Biden. Biden is, is an evildoer. Mm -hmm. He says he's Catholic, but he's promoting the murder of babies, homosexual marriage. He's promoting little children, having their genitals mutilated, telling a little boy he can become a girl or a, a little girl that she can become a boy. This is demonic. Yeah. And yet we hear virtually nothing from most Catholic bishops. Virtually nothing. There are a few. There are a handful of good guys out there. The bishop in Lincoln, Nebraska is a good man. There's a bishop in Oklahoma. Very good man. Strickland down in Texas. But they stand out because there's so few of them. Mm -hmm. And this should be normal. The yeah. bishops wear red because it's a sim symbolism of their martyrdom. <laughs> so I'm grieved and I'm frightened 
because the scripture says that judgment begins at the house of God. What judgments, chastenings are we going to endure because of our failure to stop the slaughter? If, if the Catholic hierarchy in America had simply done its duty to intervene on behalf of the babies, mm -hmm. abortion would already be illegal in all 50 states. It would have ended decades ago. Mm -hmm. Because the single largest voting bloc inside of the Democrat Party are Catholics. Yeah. It's not African Americans, it's Catholics. And if Catholics had said, we're not going to be a part of murdering babies and promoting homosexuality, these are sins that cry to God for vengeance. We will not be a part of this. And if the bishops had said, you cannot in good conscience vote for somebody who has told you that they're going to use your vote to kill babies mm -hmm. and, to, and to promote perversion. If that had happened, this would all be behind us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, well, I, and I'm a Catholic as well. And I, I asked that question to you for a reason, uh, because I, I, I don't doubt that every, most Catholic priests and, and bishops are pro-life. I don't doubt that at all. I, I'm certain that they are, but why they aren't preaching from the hill the, you know, from the tops of the hills every other week about the issue of abortion it's not you know it's not debating or saying hey i'm not going to get involved in tax policy or trade you know the trade agreement that's going on in politics right now we're talking about a major major issue that has repercussions for the souls of of the people they're trying to elevate right i mean if their job as priests and bishops is to in a sense get as many of us to heaven as possible right that's their it's my goal, your goal, and their goal, then they have to be talking about this issue, and they don't. I, sadly, not enough of them do. I, again, well, I don't doubt just, their pro-life. I completely agree, but it's not just talking about it. It's doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, Cardinal O'Connor marched with us. We had priests, dozens of priests arrested with us. Mm -hmm. Multiple bishops. It was either six or seven bishops that were arrested with us in the heyday, and there are many bishops today who were priests then who got arrested with us. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's not simply getting arrested, mm -hmm. but it is using the office, being faithful to the office, and being the watchman on the wall. Mm -hmm. Isaiah rebuked the leaders and he said they're like dumb dogs that cannot bark. They're supposed to be warning people. They're supposed to be saying, rup, 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 there's danger coming. And but they're silent. And Benedict, Pope Benedict, used that as a rebuke to many of the clergy that they're dumb dogs. He's mm -hmm. quoting from the prophet Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very true. Okay. So I want to go into a because there again, as I said at the beginning, there's so much that you do that it's hard to to fit it into uh, you know, my format of uh, roughly 30 minutes. Um, so, so I'll, I'll probably ask you to come back numerous times over the course of my show, but, um, I want to talk about a couple of things that, that we, you and I had talked about off, uh, off the air. And that is, uh, uh specifically, you know, you, you, you make movies and, and really great movies. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about, um, uh, one in particular, but as many others as you want. And that is, uh, time boys is a movie and I watched the trailer and it, it really, I'm not just saying this, it looks really good. It looks really in, intriguing. So, um, and, and I'll actually, you know, people can go watch the trailer, but tell us about time boys, how that came about and what people, you know, can expect when they watch it. It's a time travel movie for, uh, based in 1908 and modern times. And there's a Catholic priest in the old days and a Catholic priest in the new days, but it's, it's not a ghetto film. Mm -hmm. If you've ever watched um, Christian films that are made today, mm -hmm. they tend to be redundant, predictable. This is not that. It's just a fun family movie. My One of my sons had cancer, and we moved to Memphis so he could go to St. Jude. And after that was done, in the middle of his treatment, one of my boys, Justin, said, Dad, we need to make a time travel movie. So we started writing the script and we had gotten in, involved in a big homeschool community and a music community. And so we held auditions. The director of photography uh, was a graduate of John Paul, the great film school in California. 
the editor was a graduate of John Paul the Great in California. And it just came out great. We got we got some pretty seasoned actors to be in it, as well as a bunch of people who tried out and really had acting chops. The movie has mm-hmm. won over 60 awards. Uh, so if people want to watch it, they can go to timeboysthemovie.com. Timeboysthemovie.com. And it begins streaming on a bunch of platforms in April uh, in America and around the world. We're very excited. I'm very thankful to the Lord. And Time Boys 2, the sequel, has already been shot. And that's being edited right now. Yeah, so if you're watching uh, this episode uh, on uh, wherever you're watching it, I'm scrolling the the website timeboysthemovie.com. I'm scrolling at the bottom, uh, but it's an easy one to remember, timeboysthemovie.com. And I and I was watching the, the in in the trailer, and a lot of times when you you know you get sort of uh, you know not the 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 high level Hollywood movies, you sometimes can see acting you know that's maybe B acting. The acting is really good. I mean, these are really talented people and, you know, they're really, really, really exciting and really great stuff. So, um, so how many, so you already have the sequel coming yep. and that, that that's really cool. So tell me, you know, what, what got you into movies? I mean, have you done, you've done other things, other I've movies done, and I've done television for years. I think we have over 1200 TV shows in the can. I've been on a network for 12 years now, no, 13 years. And I also did a bunch of documentaries. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we have begun production of a documentary series called Dragon Slayers, How Operation Rescue Helped to Overturn Roe versus Wade. So we've been hauling around footage and newspapers and records for 35 years, literally. You know, renting spaces with air conditioning and heating, you know, so that the stuff wouldn't deteriorate. And we have begun pre-production of what I hope is a blockbuster documentary. Now, were we are we going to show that or some of that to your people? How's that work? So, yeah, I we could definitely do that. Um, I was actually going to paste here uh, the 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 YouTube link uh, that That's people fine. go to, but. Yeah, if that's what you think, that's totally fine with me. So for any of you that are pro-life activists, we to to make a good movie, it is not cheap. You know, you don't you don't have to have a $20 million budget, but if you're gonna make a movie that's worth being on Netflix or HBO or Discovery or History Channel, it's gonna cost money, just is. So Mm -hmm. we have begun raising money to make this documentary we just started raising money i think we've raised like eleven thousand dollars but we can do the pilot of a serial documentary starting with atlanta which is where the whole thing blew up in 1988 we can do that pilot for about ninety thousand dollars and that includes high-end camera people lighting editors etc so i would be um honored if anybody would go to my website, randallterry.com, and the, right on the front page, you can click and watch the promo. And if you like what you see, then you can, you'll can you see the crowdfunding page where people can go to make a contribution, and we'd be honored and thankful. There's people out there right now that can give 1000 or $5,000 and or 100 and I would be honored if, if people would help. It's going to be so powerful. It's going to be yeah. so inspirational for the future. It's like we'll capture yeah, so the past. The, we can inspire the future. Yes, and there's some great pictures of you when you were a lot younger. It's probably <laughs> it's probably need to watch those. Well, I'm going to actually play. I'm sharing my screen for those that are watching and not listening. If you're listening, you could still hear it. Uh, and I'm going to actually play just just to you know maybe about 30 seconds of it, kind of catching it here about 30 seconds into it. So I won't play the whole thing. It's about uh, almost six minutes long. I watched it just a little bit ago, and it it, we, it went by really can quickly. Because we, we start at the beginning, so they see Oprah announcing us. Yes, let's do that. Yes, yes, no, yes, yes. I will do that. I'll do that right was. now. Oprah Winfrey is promoting Operation Rescue. <laughs> It's called Operation Rescue, and they say that their mission is to stop what they call the murder of innocent babies, no matter what price they have to pay. Now they're on the way to jail, and if they come back tomorrow, we'll arrest them again tomorrow, and so forth and so on. We're going to maintain law and order. We expected them to be rougher than usual. But we didn't. 
severe pain on people. Understand why you put somebody in jail in America because they don't want to see babies killed. And frankly, I can't understand that either. Can you tell us how many total arrests were there today? 591. They aren't in Kansas anymore. Today, the anti-abortion group Operation Rescue and pro-choice supporters are drawing battle lines in Buffalo. Nearly 2,000 people have turned out at this church just northeast of Buffalo to pray and to plan, calling on the name of God to bless their efforts to rescue unborn babies. Lord God, tonight as we lift up our hands to you. We as a church and individuals needed to repent of our lack of involvement on trying to stop the killing of innocent children. We are not going down there as the heroes. We are going down there in a spirit of repentance. We are guilty. The blood is on our hands. We're 15 years late. There's no heroes here. We are more guilty than the police when they take us away because the police are not called to be the salt of the earth. We are. Mike, I know that the mayor of Buffalo, as you mentioned last night on Nightly News, practically invited the demonstrators from Operation Rescue. What does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? Well, according to the Good Samaritan, it means that if your neighbor is in danger of death, dying in the ditch, you save him. We're going down to a killing center today. Many of you are placing yourselves in a vulnerable position. You might be hurt and this man's severely fractured arm. But if you begin to suffer, you must still do nothing wrong. It's getting arrested too radical. It's obvious it, it can't be too radical in the face of mass murder. You are as safe in jail as you are in the protective hands of God any place else. The mercies of God are everlasting and are new every morning. And you see them in jail in a way that you never do any other place. I was arrested over 50 times, uh, in jail over 50 times. The one thing that it has done is to bring this issue a little bit more clearly before the minds of other people. Media coverage is critical to bringing your message out to the public, to the masses. Finally, there are Christians by the hundreds who are putting their bodies and their freedom on the line to save innocent children and to create the social tension that was so desperately needed. Operation Rescue is a new and a fresh breath of air. Politicians never see the light until they feel the heat. There was a Monday in America where you could own a slave and then the following Monday, you could not. And I don't think that many hearts were changed between those two Mondays. What was changed was the law. We're saving children and mothers today. We're doing it in such a way that will provide the political clout to change the laws tomorrow. And we will launch an equal force against state legislatures to chip away at Roe and to ultimately make child killing illegal again. I am convinced Roe will fall and child killing will be driven back to hell where it came from. Friend, as you can see, this is a huge undertaking. We are asking for your financial help. Our goal with this documentary is to capture the history of what happened and to show how the rescue movement went to seed and was a key part of bringing down Roe versus Wade. And we also want to inspire the next generation to take this battle to completion and to make it a crime in all 50 states.
to kill a baby from conception until birth. Please be as generous as you can and invite your friends to do the same. God bless you. So I ultimately played the whole video and um, because I think it was so powerful and I think it, it's, it, uh, it needs to be heard and um, it, it needs to be heard because as I said in the beginning, you know, when you saw those, those videos and images of, you know, so long ago, you could tell those are old videos and yet we're still fighting. Even when Roe v. Wade has been overturned, we're still having to fight and you're still, you know, so the support is needed. You, you know, you indicated, you know, the support is continues and, and honestly, I don't think it will ever end. Um, and so that's I, why I wanted to play win. the whole thing. We will win. And the reason we will win is because there's a God in heaven. The, the issue is what will happen to America if we don't repent sooner. So sin, the, the sin of shedding innocent blood is a sin that cries for vengeance in Jeremiah 18, God talks about decreeing judgment on a nation. But if the nation repents, then God said he will change his mind about the judgment. What, what frightens me right now is that prior to Roe versus Wade being overturned, we could say, hey, it's not our fault. The Supreme Court did this. They pushed it down the throat of the country. But now, state after state, is saying, hey, let's have a referendum. Let's have a referendum to make abortion legal. We want to kill our babies. California, Michigan, this is demonic. Mm -hmm. This is terrifying. So I feel like it, it's us being set up for judgment. We mm -hmm. can't say, God, this was pushed on us by the Supreme Court because that's not what's happening in, in many states. The people are clamoring for the right to kill their baby, and that will bring the chastening hand of God. My latest book will be out this month. It's called Divine Correction, How God Gets a Nation's Attention. And it's an overview of the scriptures, how God deals with the sins that cry for vengeance. So that will be coming out soon. Uh, People can see all this stuff at my website, randallterry.com. I wrote the book. It took me three years to writing and rewriting and rewriting because I wanted it to be for clergy. It is a book that any layman can pick up and read and understand, but it's a very paced book that will be of as much value 50 or 100 years from now as it is right now. So I'm not just you know talking about Joe Biden or whatever. This is a book about what the scriptures say about divine correction from Genesis to Revelation. And I hope people get it and give it to their pastor, give it to your priest. Yeah, I, I hope people get it too. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and definitely pastors need to, to step up because this is serious. Uh, again, as I said in the beginning about Ohio, we have a, a ballot initiative coming up. And if it were to pass, it is in the Ohio constitution. And, and that just makes, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't stop, we stop fighting at that point, of course, but it's certainly... Uh, makes the fight much, much more difficult. So every state has to do this. Uh, I, boy, we could keep talking on and on and on. And as I said, I hope you uh, come on back and, and talk about, you know, when your book comes out, come on back. But it has been a tremendous honor and priv privilege to have Randall Terry here. I Again, I never would have thought in a million years that I'd be speaking uh, to the founder of Operation Rescue when I remember seeing everything about Operation Rescue when I was much younger, and yet here I am, and you've so graciously uh, given of your time to come on and talk to me, uh, lonely old me, and uh, it, that shows your dedication. So, Randall Terry, thank you so much for all that you do, and thank you for coming on. Jerry, it's been my, my privilege, brother. God bless you. You've been a great host. I enjoyed it, and I look forward to doing it again. Absolutely. Uh, thank you again. And thank all of you for listening to this episode of Fide's podcast. Please go to timeboysthemovie.com and go to randallterry.com uh, for all of his information. Please check him out. Support 
definitely support. This is a fight. Uh, check out all my shows on all my all the different podcast apps on YouTube, on Rumble, and on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on RightAmericanMedia.com. So thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time.